Hello, I'm Valera. Uh, this is my clever Twitter handle that I just added to the slide. Uh, if you're interested, um, I share some thoughts on Twitter sometimes uh, about developer experience. Um, so uh, let me let me start by just telling a personal anecdote. Uh, whenever I see the word experience, uh, I think of um, a day when I was graduating from college and I was looking for jobs. And this one consulting company in Chicago um, invited me for an interview and they put me up in this fancy hotel, Hotel Amalfi. And when I went to check in, uh, they didn't have a reception area. They, they had this like kind of a lounge table like this and there was a guy with like a laptop sitting there um, and he was like checking on guests. And every time the phone would ring, because that was back in the day when people would call, um, uh, he would answer the phone and in this British accent, he would say, hello, Hotel Amalfi, how may I enhance your experience? And so I just thought that was that was amazing. Um, and having a British accent just gives you like automatically a lot of credibility. Um, unfortunately, I don't have one, so I'll have to just do without that. Um, but uh, let me just start off with a few more things uh, out of Twitter. So uh, maybe you follow this I am developer thing. Um, and uh, you know, most developers will choose their own experience over end users experience when evaluating a tool or solution. Uh, we love emojis and CLI output. How many of you would choose that kind of tool that has emoji and CLI output? Come on, come on. Of course. I've been using this, uh, you know, recently I got bored of my shell and I switched to this uh, iTerm2 thing and with Z shell and like, it's really cool. I just want to now just constantly stay in my, you know, shell like all the time, you know, I don't want to leave it. Um, so that's, that's another example, you know, that I like to use. Uh, we had this internal chat uh, not, not so long ago, uh, it's like, well actually no, this was a while ago, um, talking about developer productivity, you don't have to read the whole thing, uh, I took a little excerpt out of this, I think there's an enormous amount of developer productivity and job satisfaction that could be recaptured by making the systems we depend on more reliable, said Scott Sandler, and I couldn't agree more. And then finally there's, there's this guy, uh, Cal Henderson who does in fact have a British accent and also happens to be the CTO of our company, who exactly three years ago, uh, I've been in Slack for three, three and a half years or so, uh, said this, we want Slack to be the best place in the world to develop, to make software, the best place in the world. So that's Cal. Uh, and so I was sitting there and we, we were not yet in this beautiful building. We were uh, in another office, but you know, we, we had already screenshots of like our new office and I was thinking, okay, we have a beautiful office. We have an amazing coffee program at Slack. And then we make our developers look at this. So the, the reality between what Cal said and what we actually had and still actually to this day have um, is, you know, we're, we have a lot of work to do. Um, but it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, this is uh, out of the ex Googler channel, uh, which I'm a part of uh, at Slack. And there's like, you know, people there talking about how they miss these amazing tools that Google had. Uh, and I, you know, just to kind of drive the point home, uh, one of the per people I used to work with at Google, he said like he would hesitate to leave the company because of the, the tool chain, you know. And so out of that, uh, when we kind of did our last vision exercise on, on our team, uh, we kind of came up with this, that, you know, instead of saying the best in the world, you know, that's like very, uh, I don't know, ambitious maybe, uh, you know, like it would be cool if, uh, if developer experience at Slack was actually like a retention tool and, and a, you know, would attract people uh, to come here. So, you know, maybe in five years. And also why developer experience? There's a lot of names for this area like productivity engineering and internal tools and uh, you know, infrastructure and whatnot. Uh, I think naming is really important in this case. The way that you name your team like, really shapes the way that people think about what they're building. Uh, and on this one, this really obscure picture, uh, I like to refer to what our CEO said once about Slack. This is uh, Stuart Butterfield, he said, we don't build saddles around here. You know, we build like uh, an experience, you know, for, for the end users, right? So uh, we don't build, in, we do build internal tools uh, and infrastructure, 
but really like we do it because we want people to have a cool experience here and we want them to come to work and like most of the time they're spending hopefully working you know here so we want them to have a good experience and so our, our team's mission is uh, to build tools and systems that empower mobile developers to ship code with confidence while enjoying a pleasant and productive engineering experience. And the way I like to think about this uh, is it's kind of like a, a bit of a balancing game. Because uh, you know, if you think about this, you could make a pretty good workflow, developer workflow, if you just allow developers to just merge into master without any quality checks. People like pretty pleasant. Uh, but they wouldn't be very safe and they wouldn't feel safe doing that. So, uh, and we often actually encounter this like trade off between like how much do we want to enforce quality and how much do we want to sacrifice workflow? And you'll see that later in the talk. So, a little bit about our team. Uh, we are currently eight people. Things change uh, quickly at Slack. Um, uh, half of the well, almost half of the team is based in actually in New York. Uh, we're hiring, you know, so we're interested. Uh, the other half is here in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, here's what we support we support two platforms. Uh, two, we only have two applications so far, thankfully. Uh, they're both sitting on external github.com repos, uh, as opposed to the rest of our code bases, which are on a GitHub enterprise. Uh, we have roughly 60 mobile developers at Slack, so uh, about 30 on each platform. And uh, so, the, you know, the previous speaker talked about the scale there that Strava had, and we, we have, uh, I guess, roughly like 2x of that. So we have about 100 PRs merged to master per week per repo. Uh, we run 13 required checks uh, to, to merge your change into Android, and that takes about 26 minutes. Five required checks on iOS, 34 minutes. Uh, and we, we have actually quite a lot of tests. Our developers, thankfully, write tests. Uh, I was just updating the slide today, and I noticed the huge amount of progress that iOS had made. Uh, previously, that was not the case, but they're really catching up to Android. So that's really great to see. And all of these tests run on every single PR. You know, The minute the developer opens a PR, they all run pre-merge. CI, uh, we have uh, one, one of many uh, at Slack uh, Jenkins instances. Uh, we, uh, we have about 30 Jenkins jobs. Uh, this number, I hadn't updated today, so it may be larger now, but about uh, 5,000 CI runs per week. Um, and we have uh, a lot of Android build nodes because they're cheap. They're just like easy to provision. We just provision AWS uh, nodes, and we can like auto scale very easily. On iOS, this is another theme of this uh, talk, everything is difficult. We use a third-party provider called Max Stadium. We use their VMs. Um, not like super happy with VMs, so we're actually test testing bare metal right now. Um, and we have a lot less because it's super expensive. As far as releases, uh, we have a similar uh, program, uh, Alpha Dog Food, that uh, goes out automatically to internal customers every night. Uh, we release to beta every week, uh, and then every two weeks we have you know the release train that leaves um, and uh, gets released to external users every two weeks. We would love to get this down to one week, so we do have a goal around that. And I also have a slide about mobile is different, uh, you know, with a few um, thoughts there. As the previous spe speaker mentioned, there's no fast rollback, so you are you know you have kind of one shot to get it right. Uh, we have a huge test matrix. I mean, there, you know, there's huge test matrices on, on all platforms, but I think on mobile, especially on Android, it used to be like, you know, the device and API level fragmentation is huge. Um, and then we have opinionated platform tools. So every platform has its own, you know, kind of um, set of um, tools and challenges. And then I put this in, under here, you know, Apple doesn't like developers. Yeah, I don't know why you know they don't, but uh, that's that's been my impression so far. I, I come from more from an Android background, if you can tell. Uh, but someday I think they will. They will come around and like developers. So what's our current uh, developer experience like? Uh, we're we actually have benefited a lot from kind of staying very vanilla so far. We haven't like gone off the the beaten path, um, and we've stayed with the platform tools. 
so you know this is the beautiful Android Studio ID. Um, GitHub kind of PR checks, uh, very standard stuff. Uh, Jenkins, how many people here, by the way, how many companies use Jenkins? Just curious. Okay, almost everyone. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, I was yeah. It's it's interesting. I when I first you know got to Slack, I really was like thinking, oh, what is this thing? But you know, I'm I've gotten used to it. And I guess it has its own kind of um, charm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of people use it. Like it's it's cool, Jenkins. You know. Um, but we've we've also invested slightly where we have kind of invested in our own tools. It's it's been around surprise integrations with Slack. Uh, so this is an example of a build failure notification uh, that uh, one of our interns actually built, and now she's back full time, thankfully. Um, so it just kind of parses the you know the beautiful Jenkins UI console output, and then kind of presents it in a nice um, human readable format. Uh, and uh, you know, here's another sort of performance testing notification um, with some feedback buttons that I'll talk about later. And then recently, uh, as a kind of a side project, one of our engineers just decided, hey, like, wouldn't it be cool if developers can merge their changes and get a notification um, whenever their PR is ready to be merged and has been approved? Uh, and you know, you can just click a button from Slack and do this. I didn't really think much of it, but it turns out this was like a, made everyone super happy. So uh, we also have um, kind of a front end because we're you know my team we're kind of lazy and we don't like to build uh, websites. We use this sort of um, analytics like visualization tool for some you know some dashboards and um, things like this that we present to developers. So. Um, most of the this is kind of this was kind of an intro about you know what is developer experience just to give you a feel of how we approach it. Uh, but I'd like to really kind of uh, slice and dice it from the standpoint of how we measure it. Um, and why do we even want to measure things? So we kind of have to ask you know if we want to be successful in in our mission, uh, we have to answer these questions. How are we doing right now? Uh, are we trending in the right direction? Are we prioritizing the right things? And are we solving what, you know, finally, can we actually like validate what we set out to solve? And another way, you know, this is a person I follow on, on Twitter and I highly recommend following uh, this person, uh, Luke. He actually came and gave a great talk at Slack a while back. Uh, but he, I believe he is a product manager at Google and uh, he talks about a lot about user experience. So not necessarily developer experience, but user experience. And he recently had this tweet that basically, like, you are what you will build what you're measuring eventually. So you really have to think very carefully about what it is that you measure in developer experience. Um, and one of the things that I would love for you know all everyone who builds tools and infrastructure for developers to think about is approach your mission as you would with you know like a, of a as if you were building a product you know for external users. So do all the things that like companies do for product engineering. And measurement is pretty important for that. And so of course, um, I come kind of from a background of test automation and, and I, um, you know, I was thinking about like the, the various types of feedback that, that we gather and how we measure things at Slack. And of course I came up with a pyramid, you know, it's like uh, instead of a testing pyramid, it's, it's the feedback pyramid. Uh, and at the bottom, you kind of have a layer of telemetry. So this is like automated data that you can gather about developer experience. In the middle, you have surveys, and at the top, you have listening. And you know, as you go up this pyramid, the effort to gather the information becomes higher, but also you get a lot more detail, get a lot more bias also. However, on the bottom, it's cheap to gather, and the volume of data is a lot bigger. So I'm going to go into each of these and kind of like explain and kind of demonstrate what, how we approach these things at Slack. So first, telemetry. It's amazing how much kind of benefit you can get out of a very simple script that you know we plugged into our CI pipeline and Jenkins that you know basically just uploads build uh, you know stats about a build that just finished to the backend. 
it, it, you know, just basically like gathers what, you know, was it successful? Was it not? How much, how long did it take? You know, and a few other like metadata things. And just from this very simple like instrumentation that we added, uh, we can build these kinds of things. So first of all, a uh, metric that we defined and we actually talked about in another meetup uh, is called time to mergeable. So often, you know, we, with users, we talk about like time to usable. Time to mergeable is like our time to usable for, for developers. Developers apparently really care about how quickly they can merge changes to master for some reason. Um, and uh, so this is kind of a metric where if all of your checks on your PR passed, how long would that take? You know, like best case scenario, how long would it take for you to merge safely into master? Uh, and the cool thing here is that we can kind of break down, you know, our CI pipeline into this like sort of heat map and we can see how long each stage of the pipeline takes and then we can kind of optimize these things. You now we can kind of see what the long tail is and optimize them. Another thing we track is master build stability. So it theoretically, you know, since we have all these wonderful PR checks, master build should always pass, right? So if, if it's not 100%, it's not good. And then we can analyze why that's happening most of the time since flaky tests. Uh, another thing that we kind of introduced and has actually really helped uh, improve, you know, kind of our triage volume and drive it down is uh, metrics about how we support our customers internally at Slack. So we have these triage channels. People can come in and post like issues with a red dot, blue dot, or white dot. And then we track the volume of these issues with time. And then we track our SLAs, um, you know, how, how closely we are, how closely we stick to our SLAs. Test trends is one that we, you know, introduced recently. And this one is kind of really interesting because it's super simple. Like, you know, how, how are the unit tests just trending with every PR merged to master? You could see kind of iOS catching up on the right there. Another thing we instrumented was local build times. Um, this one we kind of had mis mixed success with. Uh, we had a project, a quarter long project where two engineers on Android and iOS uh, were basically trying to improve our local build times. Um, and it was like really hard to get any signal out of the data because it's so wildly variable. So um, one of the things that I heard you know, from someone um, from Facebook recently is that one of the things you could do there is like actually target the outliers. The outliers are where the pain points are for developers. If you like improve a P50, uh, people won't notice that much. But if you improve, uh, you know, the P99 time, people will actually notice more. Um, so it's, you know, it's nice to have this data. We haven't yet seen success out of using it. But uh, one of the things, one of the directions that we're, we're heading recently um, is, you know, the, we had this like kind of simple script that was, you know, instrumenting our pipelines and local build times. Uh, but one of the things that it didn't provide us was information about causality. And I'll try to explain this. So uh, there's this technique called tracing where you can basically like trace uh, a graph of like operations, right? So think about a CI pipeline or a local build, you know, local build, build process that happens, may happen in parallel, that may happen serially. And essentially it's just like logs, you know, so that you have these events with time, but the cool thing about traces is that they're all tied to like kind of like one central place. There's a trace ID that all events are tied to, and you can see where things start and end. Uh, and it's absolutely wonderful for, for distributed stuff like Jenkins CI pipelines. Uh, and you know, the, probably the best way to sort of represent uh, what tracing is, is to just look at visualizations. So you can get really cool um, visualizations using this tool called Honeycomb. It's a third party service. Um, and it, you know, it shows you like heat maps of, of how your traces are kind of distributed in time. And then you can start looking at loud layers, you can select them, and then you can kind of drill into them and you can get this kind of Gantt chart, you know? So this is like a CI, you know, or a test process that we have. Uh, this is actually not for mobile. I just stole this from another presentation, but, uh, you know, where you can kind of see, okay, here's the, where the test began to run. Here are all the steps that are part of it. You know, they run in parallel. Here's where things start and here's where things end. So this really like is more powerful than uh, the data that we have currently have on mobile um, because it can really like help you drill into things. The other thing that Honeycomb has that's really amazing is that uh, it's a feature called Bubble Up. Um, and the Bubble Up, what it, what it does is if you select a group of outliers, 
uh, it will basically like intelligently analyze the outliers, the characteristics uh, of the outliers that make them outliers. So like it will compare and say like, for example, we noticed that um, like developers that had really slow build times, their machines were like really slow, you know? So, or like they were like this previous model or they had less RAM. So like it kind of slices and dices things on like various characteristics that you send up with the events and then it like naturally surfaces them. You know, having the, doing this manually would be really hard. You'd really have to like know which questions to ask, whereas Honeycomb kind of like surfaces it automatically. So it's, you know, tracing is like the new hotness at Slack right now. I really like highly recommend uh, everyone to think about using it in their developer experience. And one last thing about metrics is that they're not really very useful unless you look at them on a regular basis. So uh, we, you know, we have a bunch of dashboards uh, and we try to review them every single week uh, and ask questions about the data that we see, the trends that we see, and then basically form action items out of those questions. And here's an example, you know, coming back to this test trends um, uh, trend that, that you see there. Uh, if you notice, like, the, the difference between Android and iOS is really interesting. On Android, you kind of see these, like, spikes, and then things, like, regularly fall, and then they go up, and then they, you know, it's kind of jagged. Whereas on iOS, it just kind of keeps going up. And uh, I asked the question of, like, why is this happening? Uh, it turns out that on Android, when feature flags get removed, unit tests get removed with, with these feature flags. And so I was asking myself, well, why does this not happen on iOS? And uh, I started digging into it, and I learned that, you know, the way that feature flags, first of all, are used on iOS are very different. Um, it turns out that iOS developers, because they feel actually less safe merging their, their changes and shipping them to customers, they, uh, they have much more granular feature flags. So there's, like, less tests associated with, uh, with every feature flag. The other thing is that iOS... Um, the legacy code that is being stripped out when a feature flag gets removed often doesn't have tests associated with it. So that's why you kind of see this like trend, you know, that just keeps going up and up and there's not a lot of drops. It just kind of reflects the test automation maturity of the platform. Um, and this is another point I wanted to make about developer experience is that I think there's, there's a benefit to having a team that works on across two platforms. You know, if we specialized on Android and iOS only, we would have never looked at these things side by side, you know, and it would have, we wouldn't have like asked ourselves this question. So there is like a certain benefit of having a team that can cover both platforms. So telemetry, um, just to recap, it's cheap, it's real time, you can kind of make alerts off of it, uh, but it doesn't really capture the big picture uh, and it doesn't capture developer sentiment. So let's look into that. In a way, yeah, I kind of view telemetry as this. It's a unit test you know, the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, you could have, you know, it can be showing you great stuff. Like, hey, the test trends are going up. It's, it's like fantastic. But in reality, your ship might be sinking. So that's where surveys come in. So we survey our users, we survey our developers. Uh, surveys, uh, we do them, we try to do them infrequently. Maybe our developers think it's not that infrequent, but like about every quarter. Um, we try to keep them very short uh, and we allow for free form feedback. We started out with a very simple Google form and that was okay. Um, and we kind of measured the things that we care about. Uh, but then we switched to this app called Poly, it's a Slack app. And uh, one of the cool things with Poly is that since it was in Slack and I don't know, maybe because people at Slack like using Slack, our response rate dramatically increased. So that was cool, that was really good. And so surveys uh, are cool because, first of all, they show you trends over time. How are we trending? You know, it's kind of you take this data point once every quarter, and then you get this wonderful qualitative feedback. Uh, so every mobile developer out there, I'm sure, complains about local build time. It's never fast enough. Um, and uh, I forget what the second one is about. So, Oh, yeah, uh, th that was a funny one. Uh, we... So uh, we, we used to ask this question of how confident are you about merging your own changes to master? And so we got, a, you know, people like rated it on a scale of one to five, but they also left free form feedback attached to that question. And one of the feedbacks was, well, I feel confident merging my changes. I don't feel confident about the other people's changes. 
so then we re, you know we actually rephrase the question of like how how confident are you that changes merge to master are you know not breaking things and then we saw a significant like decrease in in confidence and quality so freeform feedback attached to the score is is really key you know it's like it's really helps you like understand why people are scoring certain things lower or higher um, and kind of adjust your survey accordingly we also experimented with uh you know went even a step further um experiment with nps um and asked from the standpoint of developer tooling how likely are you to recommend slack as a great place to develop mobile applications and the reason i say experimented is we did this for a couple of quarters then we got feedback from uh, kind of a research data person who said that oh, I don't really like NPS. It's like the scale is really confusing. It's like a 10 point scale. It's hard to like reason, you know, about the scores and are they good? Are they bad? Uh, I don't, you know, we, we kind of dropped the question on our latest survey, but I actually kind of miss it. So I'm, I'm thinking of putting it back. I, I don't know. I liked the NPS thing. So surveys, uh, they show you, they do show you the big picture. Uh, they kind of cover the gap in, in that. Um, they uh, show you long-term trends, uh, but they're hard to develop and analyze. Uh, analysis just takes a lot of manual labor. And there's a question of like, are they annoying to developers? Is there like survey fatigue? You know, it's like we kind of do a lot of surveys and there's, there's a concern that developers don't really like to fill them out that much. I think you can kind of address that by actually making sure that developers see that you saw their feedback and like talking back to them and saying, hey, here's what you told us. This is like actually, you know, we're looking at this, we're developing our goals from this. So, uh, but they are kind of slightly annoying. You have to keep kind of, kind of keep an eye on that. So heading up the pyramid, uh, if you notice between telemetry and surveys, there's kind of like a wide gap, you know, it's like we gather this data every second and then it's like every quarter. And so um, that got me thinking, like, can we insert something into that gap? We don't have LaCroix anymore. LaCroix? LaCroix? Yeah, we don't have that anymore. We're sustainable and we have these like um, uh, vending machines or whatever you call them, right? I don't know how sustainable they are. They have like LCD panels, you know? So, uh, <laughs> but anyway. So microsurveys are, is what kind of fits that, uh, you know, fits into that gap between telemetry and surveys. Uh, and microsurveys are, they're very lightweight human feedback and they fit within the developer workflow. Uh, we, we experimented with two of these. So first of all, the build failure notifications that you saw before, um, our intern kind of built this project uh, where we would ask people, we have these like flaky tests, right? Uh, and builds fail because of them. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if like developers can actually not only tell us when the build was like flaky, but also tell us if the tests were actually valid, like if the de detection was valid in this case. You could actually then, if everyone filled this out and did it accurately, you could actually quantify how useful your tests are. So I thought that would be wonderful. And then in the performance testing pipeline, we do the same thing. We kind of say, hey, like, does this, this is actually, is this real? And then from this, from this feedback, you can build dashboards and graphs and, and uh, effectively you can track how noisy, you know, your build failure or like performance testing alerts are. And that's really cool. But unfortunately, and, and this is like, once you build it, it's cheap to maintain. Um, and it does actually help you measure sentiment uh, in, in areas that are kind of otherwise difficult to measure with just normal telemetry. But there is some downsides. So first of all, um, there's no guarantee that a developer actually hits the right response. They don't have to. And then there's also the engagement problem. Like if you don't put it into a place where they developers find it useful, and I would even go a step further, if you don't make it blocking, like if they can merge the PR without responding to the survey, you're not going to see a great engagement like rate. So for microsurveys, uh, my take on them currently is if if it's something that you know is not doesn't happen frequently like you know for example performance testing alert doesn't you know does not fire frequently and if you're very sure that the noise rate is low you can make it blocking and then you can kind of get a good engagement rate that way so that's microsurveys um and at the top of the pyramid is listening but it's actually kind of more than listening um once in a while we like to hold these kind of group sessions and and you know once in a while I'll just sit next 
I'll often sit next to a developer at lunch. Uh, and I'll just ask them, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And this is just where you get to hear a lot of great stuff about your product. So you can have all the telemetry in the world, all the data. But if you never like talk to people, then, then it's going to be hard to actually gauge where you are. I'll, I'll go a step further here. You know, even better is actually uh, dog fooding your own stuff. It's like once in a while, go and like open, you know, PR and like see how your CI pipeline behaves or like submit a, you know, a PR to, um, to one of the mobile repos. So that goes even a step further. And it's also really important, you know, even if like you don't gather useful info, it's like just hearing people and kind of building that rapport with them and kind of makes, makes them trust you a lot, a lot more. So uh, with that, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with like, so, you know, here's, uh, this was our methodology. This is how we measure things. So how are we actually doing? Um, I'll share some data on that. So from the standpoint of developer tooling, how likely are you to recommend Slack as a great place to develop mobile applications? So this is the last time we did the NPS thing was back in April. Our NPS score was minus 14. But you can see actually it's like, it's not that, you know, that bad. Most people are kind of in the middle. They're like, okay, you know, it's cool. No, no problem. What is, what is minus 14? It's like lower than like Home Depot. I don't know if you, last time you've gone into Home Depot. <laughs> So um, effectively, like, it just means that people are okay with it, but they're not super excited about it. You know, it's not like something that's actually going to make them like stay here. You know? And you know, this comment kind of was attached to one of the NPS scores. We don't have any, you know, a whole lot of tooling that makes development here special. And I, yeah, it's true. Yeah, so we got to work on that. Uh, how pleasant and productive the development workflow is? Uh, we actually are doing. Pretty well on this. Um, most people are in the agree and you know kind of um, category here. Uh, but one of the largest complaints, of course, that we hear about you know in this area, and this is like our telemetry kind of shows us is build times, local build times, local build times. I don't know uh, if you're in the mobile space, you will hear a lot about this. It's really like never fast enough uh, unless it reaches a certain threshold where it's like oh it's instant or it's in interactive all of a sudden. So the time to mergeable metric that I showed you previously, uh, we were doing super well on Android for a while. We had, you know, developers were able to merge um, in about 15 minutes. And then we turned on, uh, we, we started shrinking some code that we were not shrinking before. Um, if you're not an Android developer, don't worry about what R8 is, but, but essentially we kind of like saw a spike and all of a sudden our time to mergeable is like in the, in the 20s. So it's, you know, something that we have to fix. Um, iOS 2, by the way, uh, has anyone here had to deal with the Xcode 11 release? Curious? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. One guy. Um, so yeah, I, Xcode 11 uh, regressed our build times significantly. I don't know if you saw the same thing, but it's a problem. I don't know why. I mean, it's supposed, new stuff is supposed to be better, right? Faster. No. Apple hates developers. So confidence about um, merging changes to master, this is the one area where we kind of struggle uh, right now. As you could see, it's like most people are neutral. Um, and it could have something to do with, you know, about this. Uh, we recently started measuring code coverage, or rather, we're focusing on just uncoverage at a very high level of granularity of like which classes are not covered by any automated tests. And we see that, you know, on Android, it's about 5%. On iOS, it's close to, well, it's 11%. And, you know, if there's, like, whole, we know that, you know, iOS developers, they, everyone has those classes in your code base that, like, are not covered by any tests. They're frequently modified, and they're super scary to refactor. And also, you know, the other uh, contributing factor here is that our iOS build stability is, is not great. Um, our tests are rather flaky, and then you can't really have confidence if like your builds are failing all the time. Another thing is uh, we measure is uh, how easy it is to write tests and add tests to our code base. I'm doing okay on that. Um, and, and actually, uh, you know, one thing to say about that is that one kind of frequent comment that we get is, well, it's easy to write tests for the new code, but the legacy code, it's like super hard. So the legacy code problem is, is uh, one that we will need to tackle at some point. So are we trending in the right direction? Uh, this is kind of numbers that I, you know, we, we've been tracking workflow quality and ease of testing. 
And uh, you can see kind of a, a negative trend there. And this is for all mobile developers at Slack. So we, we kind of asked ourselves the question of what's going on there. And we see two very different pictures on Android and iOS. Uh, so on Android, things are actually flat or they're going up. On iOS, things are in fact going down. And we recently just, in one of these listening sessions, we asked our iOS developers, what do they think is going on there? Especially the confidence and quality just kind of has been dropping over, you know, quarter over quarter for like two quarters now, significantly. And what they said is this, it's really interesting that they don't feel like things actually got worse. They just feel like the visibility of things getting worse has improved. So like all of a sudden they actually, you know, they, they realize how shitty things were previously. <laughs> so they feel a lot less confident now. So actually it's probably a positive thing and they're a lot more careful and they actually, maybe that's, that makes them write a lot more tests and that's why they're catching up in the tests. So are we prioritizing the right things? Um, here we're actually doing pretty well. One of the things I mentioned is just this communication with developers is very important. We, you know, whenever we have a survey like this, we make sure that we show them the results and then we kind of incorporate this into the survey itself. We're saying, okay, are we, out of these things that we, you know, we, uh, we're working on currently, is, is this the right set of things to work on? And then one thing that we added recently is more of like around the issue of trust is do you trust that like we actually are listening to you as far as the survey is concerned and there also people are are trusting us and, and another interesting trend with this is that because of the the trust that they have in us a lot of developers stopped filling out the survey <laughs> so they're like oh you know we you guys got it and we don't need to give you feedback a few developers that i've talked to have uh, have told me that and our response rates have actually dropped a little bit so maybe you don't want people to trust you too much here <laughs> xpt might know so uh, things that are going well, we, we have good satisfaction and workflow. Uh, I mentioned this little like merge bot thing that we had. We were kind of surprised. We didn't think that developers would love it that much, but they actually did. They, a lot of them mentioned in the last survey how much they love merge bot. So I would say the, the takeaway there is once in a while, even though like it may not be the highest priority and may not like improve any metrics, once in a while, like treat your developers, do something nice for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, customer support is one one thing that we're really happy about where we're really like on top of our triage and triage has been volume has been going down um, we, we used to spend a lot of time like supporting our developers and like helping them debug things and that that has been like improved vastly and we are adding more and more metrics uh, and as I said like tracing is kind of the next big thing that I'm really excited about Things that are not going so well, uh, iOS, uh, we are struggling with flaky tests um, and confidence and quality. We're like targeting this, that we have a project this quarter to tackle that. And on both platforms, we do need to revisit time to mergeable. It was really good for a while on Android um, and it has regressed. Local build times, this is like one of those things where unless you wanna go switch to a new build system, which every ex-Googler does, um, you know, wants to switch to Bazel. Uh, it's it's like hard to make progress on this. Like you can kind of optimize the the stuff that Android and uh, Apple give you only so much. And then there's this kind of nothing special comment. Like how can we actually to achieve our vision? We we do need to like go above and beyond. We need to get more in the NPS survey. We need to get more people into the nine and ten category. You know, not in the seven and eight. And so you know, our objectives, they're kind of evergreen objectives that reflect that. Uh, we wanna make this like mobile developer workflow work class. Uh, and at the same time, keep an eye on quality, making sure that developers own quality. One of the themes here, you know, maybe this, is, this wasn't clear from the talk is that our team isn't writing these tests. We're not actually like responsible for quality. What we are responsible for is empowering feature teams to own their own quality. So we're kind of making a big shift at Slack in the hope of you know getting to a one week release cycle um, uh, on that. Uh, basically like if feature teams own their quality, they can write their own automation and they can decide if things are you know good to go without uh, sort of feedback from manual QA. And so our roadmap um, briefly, um, a big focus as I mentioned is reducing manual regression uh, for us. Uh, we're, we're in a good spot with automation and can actually improve a lot. Um, and now that we have visibility into code coverage, we can really like prioritize this. And we can, we can now go to the feature teams and say, here's all the list of you know, manual regression tests that the uh, QA team runs. Can we stop running these essentially? 
Um, by the way, I'm not advocating that we get rid of uh, manual testing altogether. What I am advocating for is for manual testers to focus more on exploratory testing, not like going through the same kind of test cases over and over again on every release. iOS flaky tests I mentioned, we're, we're actually in the process of adopting LinkedIn's uh, test runner called Blue Pill um, that has automated reruns. We kind of just gave up on that one and said, we're not going to make our test not flaky. We're just going to build around it. Uh, next quarter, we really want to target kind of reducing the gaps in coverage and again, drive down the manual regression. Uh, and then on the quality side, we have a lot more things planned for, for later on. Um, and then on, on the uh, workflow side, um, one of the kind of frequent modes of failure for our builds these days, now on Android, for example, now that builds are not as uh, flaky there, uh, is two developers, well, developers merging changes that are out, out of date with master. Um, or, you know, two developers merging at the same time and, and, and having a conflict. So building a merge queue or adopting a merge queue that we have on other teams is, is going to be a priority for us. And we're going to partner with another team on that. And then tracing everything and, and then local build times. Hopefully we'll get to tackle that also in, um, in the next year. Why am I showing you this roadmap? Well, because if you happen to be looking for a job, maybe, and you're interested in this space, you know, we're hiring. So. Uh, if these things appeal to you, then come talk to me or Sridhar in the back. He's the eng manager for, for our team. That's all I have. Thank you. Questions. Oh, sure. Questions. Anyone got questions? Oh, yeah. Interesting. So you mentioned the merge bot is a surprise. Um, that made me think, have you had a, a situation where telemetry was posing certain areas of hotspots to be tackled? But when you do the surveys, there's that whole motive aspect that speaks to your goal of maybe want to provide. So Merchbot was interesting because I don't think it actually came out of almost any comments or anything. It was more of like one developer and our team just had an itch to build a bot and she decided to do it and, I, you know, actually did it. Um, but yeah, I think you point out a very interesting thing. It's like, how much do you, ex you know, invest in this, like making things nicer, but that maybe from like the organizational perspective are not that high priority versus like, it's like, you know, if like I, I think about this building, like how much do you invest in like the coffee program versus like, I don't know, giving everyone like, let's say an office where there's like silence all the time. <laughs> It's kind of like that, you know, one thing would make you a lot more productive. The other thing is just kind of nicer. So um, I don't know, that's it's like a tough, tough question. So I think we just, that's why I like to, you know, I like this balance. Like you have, we, every project that we work on, we have to kind of keep both in mind. Like, is this going to increase, you know, confidence and quality, uh, but at the same time, you know, degrade the workflow to the extent that developers are going to be unhappy. So I think we got to like, we need to thread the needle on that one and just kind of go somewhere in between. I think degrading is easier. It's the other one that you're going to make. Uh -huh. like it, it, and, and I was like, you like, you're like, you're like, you're like, people miss the tool chain. Mm -hmm. people yeah. Miss. Yeah, I mean, I think like the other thing I would, you know, maybe the, these kinds of things, um, actually, you know, I'll take that back. Merchbot was originally designed in a hackathon. So, so like having these kinds of outlets for engineers to once in a while just like scratch that itch and like develop something cool, like Google had the twenty percent pro you know um, program. I think that's very useful and like once in a while you should just like yeah treat not only developers but also yourself like you know kind of like do some, build something cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, it's a two-part question. So one was, what's the difference between the end-to-end -end test and the functional UI test that you had? And then second part is, 
are all of these blocking a check-in, which is the 20 minute cycle that you described? Yeah, so all of them are blocking. Um, and the difference between end-to-end -end and functional, so functional, we wrote a big blog post about how we do functional uh, UI testing on Android. And they're very targeted. They mock out the, the data layer. Um, and so they're kind of like just, they're really, it's like an integration test between our uh, business logic and the UI logic. Um, and they're usually just targeting a single screen. Whereas the end-to-end -end tests, they, uh, I actually used to really not, not believe in end-to-end -end testing. I, I thought that we could never get it not to be not flaky. Uh, but when one person on our team maintained this test suite through like sheer heroics of 100 end-to-end -end tests, and they would regularly catch bugs. And so finally, we decided like, hey, why don't we actually make them reliable uh, enough that we can run them like on every PR at first. And then we decided, well, why don't we run them as pre-merge because they're stable enough. So now we have a test suite of 78 tests. These tests, they, they don't do any sort of swapping out of the you know, uh, application and they hit a real basically production backend. So they are like truly end-to-end. -end. We catch some backend bugs once in a while. So that's like the, the negative aspect of it is that if there's like an issue in the backend, it can block developer merges. Uh, and then we kind of have to like maybe quickly turn off the requirement. Uh, but at the same time, they do on a regular basis catch bugs. So we're actually, I submitted a talk for DroidCon. If it gets accepted, we'll talk about end-to-end -end testing and how we do it on Android. <clears throat> so um, my question is about Blaze, I mean, uh, Buzzle. Um, so theoretically, how fast do you think it, it will make your build? I mean, do you have, have, you done, have you done any research? Do you have any data on that? <clears throat> So the, the reason why um, I want Blaze or Bazel on iOS is because Xcode doesn't have any remote build cache, caching and, and Bazel does. And so it can make a huge difference. Uh, so you can watch a talk, go on YouTube, like Pinterest gave a talk about Bazel adoption. It was a year long project for like several engineers. So it's not cheap, but it can give you like um, faster builds. The other thing that Bazel has is if you're aware of what instant run is, it's like hot, hot patching kind of. Um, they had a, I know internally Google had a working version of it for Android, so I was super interested in that, but they haven't released it externally. So I'm less interested in Bazel for Android now than I am for Bazel for iOS because of the remote build caching. One more question. Um, so what do you think is responsible for the disparity between uh, your iOS team and your Android team? Because in my last company, uh, iOS was significantly ahead of Android. And by the way, I'm iOS. So. Sorry, I missed the first part of your question. What is responsible for what? Uh, the disparity. So the like, disparity, yeah. why, why is Android so far ahead of iOS? Good question. Um, I have lots of thoughts. So um, what, what was fascinating to me is how much the company culture of the company that produces the platform bleeds into the community. So I believe it has everything to do with iOS, like Apple culture and this sort of like silos that they built. And like, I mean, I have, I did not, I have never worked at Apple, but from what I hear, it's like, there's a lot of like kind of thing, things are very siloed and, and secretive. And, and because of that, they, they don't, they actually like don't listen to developers as much as on Android. I, on Android, I, I know the people that work on the platform, they are very receptive to feedback. They were not always like that, but uh, in the last like two or three years, they really came around on that regard. So I think like Android provides you, Google provides you better tools out of the box. Um, and they're like kind of making progress faster because they're listening to feedback. Um, I think, yeah, there's like, uh, also I've heard that Apple is, they target more like your kind of small development shops. So like two or three developers versus like larger, you know, basically iOS at scale is a lot bigger of a challenge than Android. Android also benefits from the Java ecosystem. So like the fact that it's in Java, you get a lot of like tools, um, with that. So I think there's just a combination of factors, but the fascinating thing to me is how much the culture of the company, the engineering culture of the company 
that makes the platform affect the how developers actually like write to their platform. So. All right. Well, thank you very much, Valera. Everyone, give him a hand.